Welcome to Jack Reads. If you're new here, thanks for visiting the channel. My name is Jack Parks, and in this series I'm narrating 10 minutes or so of classic works of literature per video. The idea behind the channel is to revisit the works and have some fun in a world that can be over the top sometimes. If you're a returning guest, welcome back, and I'm happy to see you again. If you find some value in the video, even for just a second, please consider hitting the like button, subscribing, and hitting the bell to get notified of future content. It's absolutely free and really helps the channel to grow. For your information, Amelia Earhart thinks this is a great way to spend time and de-stress. So, this is the part where I let you grab your favorite beverage or do whatever it is you like to do while watching videos, and then hopefully, you enjoy the video. Thanks. Peter Pan, Peter and Wendy, by J.M. Barry, James Matthew Barry, narrated by Jack Parks. Chapter 1. Peter Breaks Through All children, except one, grow up. They soon know that they will grow up, and the way Wendy knew was this. One day, when she was two years old, she was playing in a garden, and she plucked another flower and ran with it to her mother. I suppose she must have looked rather delightful, for Mrs. Darling put her hand to her heart and cried, Oh, why can't you remain like this forever? This was all that passed between them on the subject, but henceforth Wendy knew that she must grow up. You always know after you are two. Two is the beginning of the end. Of course, they lived at fourteen, and until Wendy came, her mother was the chief one. She was a lovely lady with a romantic mind and such a sweet, mocking mouth. Her romantic mind was like the tiny boxes, one within the other, that come from the puzzling east. However many you discover, there is always one more, and her sweet mocking mouth had one kiss on it that Wendy could never get, though there it was, perfectly conspicuous in the right-hand corner. The way Mr. Darling won her was this. The many gentlemen who had been boys when she was a girl discovered simultaneously that they loved her, and they all ran to her house to propose to her, except Mr. Darling, who took a cab and nipped in first, and so he got her. He got all of her, except the innermost box and the kiss. He never knew about the box, and in time he gave up trying for the kiss. Wendy thought Napoleon could have got it, but I can picture him trying, and then going off in a passion, slamming the door. Mr. Darling used to boast to Wendy that her mother not only loved him, but respected him. He was one of those deep ones who know about stocks and shares. Of course, no one really knows, but he quite seemed to know, and he often said stocks were up and shares were down in a way that would have made any woman respect him. Mrs. Darling was married in white, and at first she kept the books perfectly, almost gleefully, as if it were a game, not so much as a Brussels sprout was missing. But by and by, whole cauliflowers dropped off, and instead of them there were pictures of babies without faces. She drew them when she should have been totting up. They were Mrs. Darling's guesses. Wendy came first, then John, then Michael. For a week or two after Wendy came, it was doubtful whether they would be able to keep her, as she was another mouth to feed. Mr. Darling was frightfully proud of her, but he was very honorable, and he sat on the edge of Mrs. Darling's bed, holding her hand and calculating expenses, while she looked at him imploringly. She wanted to risk it, come what might, but that was not his way. His way was with a pencil and a piece of paper, and if she confused him with suggestions, he had to begin at the beginning again. Now don't interrupt, he would beg of her. I have one pound seventeen here, and two and six at the office. I can cut off my coffee at the office, say ten shillings, making two nine and six, with your eighteen and three makes three nine seven, with five not not in my checkbook, makes eight nine seven. Who's moving that? 
eight nine seven dot and carry seven. Don't speak mm, my own and the pound you lent to that man who came to the door. Quiet child, dot and carry child. There, you've done it. Did I say 997? Yes, I said 997. And the question is, can we try it for a year on 997? Of course we can, George, she cried. But she was prejudiced in Wendy's favor, and he was really the grander character of the two. Remember mumps, he warned her almost threateningly, and off he went again. Mumps one pound, that is what I have put down, but I dare say it'd be more like thirty shillings, don't speak, measles at one five, German measles half a guinea makes two fifteen six, don't waggle your finger, whooping cough say fifteen shillings, and so it went on, and it added up differently each time, but at last Wendy just got through, with mumps reduced to twelve six, and the two kinds of measles treated as one. There was the same excitement over John, and Michael had even a narrower squeak, but both were kept, and soon you might have seen the three of them going in a row to Miss Folsom's kindergarten school, accompanied by their nurse. Mrs. Darling loved to have everything just so, and Mr. Darling had a passion for being exactly like his neighbors. So of course they had a nurse. As they were poor, owing to the amount of milk the children drank, this nurse was a prim Newfoundland dog called Nana, who had belonged to no one in particular until the Darlings engaged her. She had always thought children important, however, and the Darlings had become acquainted with her in Kensington Gardens, where she spent most of her spare time peeping into perambulators, and was much hated by careless nursemaids, whom she followed to their homes and complained of to their mistresses. She proved to be quite a treasure of a nurse. How thorough she was at bath time, and up at any moment of the night if one of her charges made the slightest cry. Of course her kennel was in the nursery. She had a genius for knowing when a cough is a thing to have no patience with and when it needs stocking around your throat. She believed to her last day in old-fashioned remedies like rhubarb leaf and made sounds of contempt over all this newfangled talk about germs and so on. It was a lesson in propriety to see her escorting the children to school, walking sedatedly by their side when they were well behaved, and butting them back into line if they strayed. On John's footer days she never once forgot his sweater and she actually carried an umbrella in her mouth in case of rain. There is a room in the basement of Miss Folsom's school where the nurses wait. They sat on forms while Nana lay on the floor. But that was the only difference. They affected to ignore her, as of an inferior social status to themselves, and she despised their light talk. She resented visits to the nursery from Mrs. Darling's friends, but if they did come, she first whipped off Michael's pinafore and put him into one with blue braiding and smoothed out Wendy and made a dash at John's hair. No nursery could possibly have been conducted more correctly, and Mr. Darling knew it, Yet he sometimes wondered uneasily whether the neighbors talked. He had his position in the city to consider. Nana also troubled him in another way. He had sometimes a feeling that she did not admire him. I know she admires you tremendously, George, Mrs. Darling would assure him, and then she would sign to the children to be especially nice to father. Lovely dances followed in which the only other servant, Liza, was sometimes allowed to join. Such a midget she looked in her long skirt and maid's cap, though she had sworn when engaged that she would never see ten again. The gaiety of those romps. And gayest of all was Mrs. Darling, who would pirouette so wildly that all you could see of her was the kiss, and then, if you had dashed at her, you might have got it. There never was a simpler, happier family until the coming of Peter Pan. Mrs. Darling first heard of Peter when she was tidying up her children's minds. It is the nightly custom of every good mother, after her children are asleep, to rummage in their minds and put things straight for the next morning, repacking into their proper places the many articles that have wandered during the day. If you could keep awake, but of course you can't, you would see your own mother doing this, and you would find it very interesting to watch her. It is quite like tidying up drawers. You would see her on her knees, I expect, lingering humorously over some of your contents, wondering where on earth you had picked this thing up, 
making discoveries sweet and not so sweet, pressing this to her cheek as if it were as nice as a kitten, and hurriedly stowing that out of sight. When you wake in the morning, the naughtiness and evil passions with which you went to bed have been folded up small and placed at the bottom of your mind, and on the top, beautifully aired, are spread out your prettier thoughts, ready for you to put on. I don't know whether you've ever seen a map of a person's mind. Doctors sometimes draw maps of other parts of you, and your own map can become intensely interesting. But catch them trying to draw a map of a child's mind, which is not only confused but keeps going round all the time. There are zigzag lines on it, just like your temperature on a card, and these are probably roads in the island. For the Neverland is always more or less an island, with astonishing splashes of color here and there, and coral reefs and rackish-looking craft in the offing, and savages and lonely lairs and gnomes who are mostly tailors, and caves through which a river runs and princes with six elder brothers, and a hut fast going to decay, and one very small old lady with a hooked nose. It would be an easy map if that were all, but there is also first day at school, religion, fathers, the round pond, needlework, murders, hangings, verbs that take the dative, chocolate pudding day, getting into braces, say 99 three pence for pulling out your tooth yourself, and so on, and either these are part of the island, or they are another map showing through, and it is all rather confusing, especially as nothing will stand still. Of course, the Neverlands vary a good deal. John's, for instance, had a lagoon with flamingos flying over it, at which John was shooting, while Michael, who was very small, had a flamingo with lagoons flying over it. John lived in a boat turned upside down on the sands, Michael in a wigwam, Wendy in a house of leaves deftly sewn together. John had no friends, Michael had friends at night, Wendy a pet wolf forsaken by its parents, but on the whole the Neverlands have a family resemblance, and if they stood still in a row you could say of them that they have each other's nose and so forth. On these magic shores children at play are forever beaching their coracles. We too have been there. We can still hear the sound of the surf, though we shall land no more. Of all delectable islands, the Neverland is the snuggest and most compact, not large and sprawly, you know, with tedious distances between one adventure and another, but nicely crammed. When you play at it by day with the chairs and tablecloth, it is not in the least alarming, but in the two minutes before you go to sleep, it becomes very real. That is why there are nightlights. I love this one because Barry has such an odd, flavorful, comic way of describing people and situations. For instance, Mr. Darling being very honorable as he's doing the math to figure out if they could keep the children, factoring in diseases and illnesses they might get. He really draws out the peculiarities and uniqueness of people in character form. But is Barry... Your flavor? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And, as always, take care of yourself and those you love, and thanks for being here. See you next time.